Okay. And we're back on the build phase. I'm Mr. Ben. And this is going to be hot takes stacked as high as the waffles at Waffle House. Uh, so I've got to... <laughs> I've got to respond to some of the things Vern said in today's episode of Team Apex. Now, a few things up front. First, I did not listen to the entire show. I listened up to the point where he said the rest of the show was going to be him breaking down the team's analysis with regard to how certain, why they took certain main characters to certain events. Now, while I find that imminently fascinating, and I'm really looking forward to listening to that, I, there's not going to be a lot to respond there. Like, what am I going to do? Go, oh, your thinking in 2019 was incorrect. No, 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 no. That's just going to be like a learning experience for me. Uh, so I feel relatively safe in cutting off the last 20 minutes or so of the show to focus on the front end. The, the other thing is I only listened to this once. So I want to upfront say that I'm going to be shooting kind of from memory. I did not take notes. I'm actually commuting for work at the moment. Uh, so I, I want to do as best I can represent Vern's ideas accurately. And, and I want to describe what he has to say in a way that he would say, yeah, that's what I meant. I do not want to misrepresent him in any capacity. So a third capa uh, point here up front kind of relates to that same thing. After the conversation we had earlier this week, I think it was Tuesday, uh, or conversation, the the podcast sparring and my a little bit of discussion over discord that we had on i think it was tuesday a community member i had never spoken to before somebody that i d don't think i've had any interactions with although it's hard to track which discord name connects to which facebook profile but overall i i think this was the first time i ever had an interaction with this individual and they reached out to me to say hey man like some of your responses make it seem like you're maybe not listening carefully to Vern's arguments or you're kind of talking past him intentionally or you're acting in bad faith, like deliberately uh, misunderstanding him to farm like dunks or whatever. Uh, th that's not a totally accurate summary. I did not take anything this person said as like stepping over a line or being insulting. It, to me, it seemed like somebody being like, hey, are you? you know, just to check in. So I want to assure everyone, it is my goal on these shows to behave with good faith. But I understand how a person who's behaving in bad faith would say the same thing. Like, mouth sounds are cheap. But nonetheless, I do want to defend my intent just a bit. Like, it is always my intent to meet a person's argument where it's being made and engage with that argument as they intended it, not to create some kind of straw man version that I can dunk on. Like that's, that's not useful for anybody. I, to be fair, sometimes when we're being flipped with each other, I th I'm sure if you look hard enough through discord or Facebook, you can find a place where I'm being deliberately dense for the purposes of a joke. But generally speaking, when I'm engaging in a serious way, I am always doing so with the intent of meeting somebody in a sincere way and understanding where they're coming from, not deliberately misunderstanding them. Uh, certainly on the show, I'm try not trying to act in any kind of like bad faith just to make somebody else look bad. I mean, first of all, I like Vern. <laughs> like, I, I like everybody uh, that generally, I pretty much like everybody that I talk about on the show. Um, yes, I may criticize or disagree, but like that shouldn't be taken as an expression of enmity uh, in any capacity. So let me try to, now that I've like preambled for five minutes, let me try to go through each of these arguments that Vern made today and try to address the very frustrating situation that I think he's also feeling, and that is talking past each other. So let's start with Dark Phoenix. And the notion that like it's like crazy that people don't want to talk about Dark Phoenix, it, to even articulate that as a thought says to me that, that you're not listening to the arguments being made. So I, I know because in this episode that I'm responding to of Apex, Vern complains a little bit about, hey, I think people are misunderstanding us. So I know he knows what that feels like. So let me, let me try to hammer this down really, really clearly. I'm tired of talking about Dark Phoenix because I'm tired of Dark Phoenix. 
full stop. So when the card was first revealed, there were people who predicted she was going to be game warping and it was going to completely change the way the top end of the illustrated universe played. And I was not of that mind. I thought, yeah, this is really good, but you have so long to get there. And I did not think she was going to be that bad. I was excited to play her. And I was excited to actually get her into my hands and play with her for quite a while, for several years. I didn't have that much of a problem with Dark Phoenix. But over time, you start to see how every new 7 drop that comes out, you also have to think about how does this compare to, does this 7 drop also let me play a 9 drop on turn 8? And the answer is almost always no. So no matter how cool a new 7 drop is, they kind of pale in comparison in the formats where you could just go Jungle Hunter Dark Phoenix. Now, I fully agree that you don't have to do that. Now, this is, this is I'm trying to be the change I want to see in the world. Uh, I'm sure Gandhi said that in reference to this specific situation. I'm trying to demonstrate engaging with Vern's argument here. I agree with you that you can find ways to deal with Dark Phoenix. You can win the game before she comes out. You can find ways to like handle her power. You can build around it so the opponent has no real good options when they finally throw down that Dark Phoenix. All of that's true. And literally none of that is engaging with the argument I'm actually making about why I'm tired of Dark Phoenix. I'm tired of Dark Phoenix because she isn't fun. Yes, there is some power level issues with the card, but I don't really care to talk about those anymore because yes you can find solutions for the power level issues and the power level isn't really my problem with dark phoenix my problem is any format in which she's legal and presumably Vern would agree with this given how he talks about uh his his expectations for other people's testing later in the show uh you have to test for her you have to swim in the cesspool that is Dark Phoenix and Dark Phoenix counter options. And it's just not fun. I'm just bored with it. It's exhausting. And because she is an outlier power level wise, you can't ever just set her aside and go, okay, even though she's legal here, I don't want to mess with this card. I'm going to focus on the new cards. I'm going to focus on other things that are more fun. And there's these dominoes that kind of fall as players engage with Dark Phoenix because it's not just high-end pressure. That's where her sort of problems are the most acute, is the pressure she puts on how you build your top of the curve in your illustrated deck. But she also applies pressure to the lower parts of the curve, because you need those counter cards. Or maybe you're on Dark Phoenix, and it's really important that you get to your Dark Phoenix before the other person gets to theirs, in the instance of like a main character like Groot. So you lean more heavily into ramp. And all of this pressure cleaves off chunks of the card pool and makes them less viable. Are are they all completely unplayable? Of course not. Like, what a silly argument. I'm not saying that. And that particular framing is something I'm going to revisit once I get a little deeper into this. Uh, something being harder to play is not always a challenge everybody is up for. So choosing the path of least resistance between you and the W is a viable way to engage with this game. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, so to kind of put a button on the Dark Phoenix conversation, um, sure, I'll engage with the power level conversation. We agree, Vern. Done. That's essentially the power level conversation. There are answers to Dark Phoenix. Where What I find annoying, and the reason I don't want to talk about this anymore, is because the things that I am actually saying about Dark Phoenix are ignored, and then I have to hear, find solutions, there's ways around it, again. Yeah, I know, and that's not what I'm talking about. What I am talking about is that playing with Dark Phoenix is boring, it isn't fun, I'm tired of it, I'm sick of this thing existing, and all of the downstream pressures that it causes on the illustrated card pool. And I totally concede that it's possible for people to not feel that way. I didn't feel that way for literally years. Literally years I played Dark Phoenix and had fun with the card. And eventually my feelings on that card completely flipped and my affection for it curdled into 
hatred, which then simmered down into just absolute boredom. It is just a tedious topic that I'm not interested in talking about anymore. And a large part of the reason I'm not interested in talking about it is because I agree with the arguments people throw back at me when this comes up. Like, at the risk of being repetitive, I agree that there are solutions to Dark Phoenix. I agree. I still think she sucks and is not fun, and the whole suite of issues that she brings to the game makes me want to play versus less than I otherwise would. That's my argument. So, if unless you can find the card that says, have more fun when you're doing a thing that's boring and isn't fun, there's not a card in the card pool that is a solution for the problem I'm actually addressing. Okay, so that's setting aside Dark Phoenix. Hopefully that's the last time I ever have to go on an engaged uh, breakdown of how I feel about that card, because I'm just so tired of talking about it. Uh, okay, to move on to middling MCs. Uh, actually, you know what? Hold on. I want to address the words groupthink. So when I hear this term, I think back to the way I learned this term, which was in school in reference to the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and all the smart people that Kennedy had in that room failing to come up with good solutions because of the groupthink. And, and to my mind, in order to apply the label groupthink, there are some very specific parameters that need to be hit. And amongst them are that the group looks negatively at outside the box thinking. Like everyone has to behave in a heterodox way. And if you don't, you will receive social pressure to get in line. Like, or I'm sorry, everyone has to behave in an orthodox way. I misused the term there. Uh, heterodox thinking is not allowed, is not welcome, is not prestigious in the community. That is groupthink. The describing of, or the applying of the word groupthink to the process of listening to a talented player talk about their thoughts on the meta and then learning from them, that just isn't groupthink. That's learning. That's, that's being influenced by an influential person. That's improving your game by taking on the knowledge that someone else has. Now, should you always accept everything that a player who's better than you says? Of course not, because there's players that are, for example, there's players that are better than me who play the game in a much different way and their play style wouldn't gel with me. Like, it just wouldn't work. Uh, I don't particularly care for playing Outriders as a deck, so I really have to, like, work at putting myself into, like, a higher gear to think about the play patterns and play that deck. And it's not that I am opposed to playing aggro. I actually really do enjoy aggro decks. There's a lot of things about what Outriders does that I do like, but the way Outriders behaves, the sort of suffocating presence they have on the board when the game first starts, it's just not the problems that I enjoy solving. So I play a different main character, and that's totally okay, but me not enjoying Outriders does not mean that they are therefore like a lower tier main character. Like their power level is independent of my relationship to that main character. And that kind of brings me to the discussion about middling MCs. Uh, when Vern talks about Bam being an emotional player and being able to get good results with a character that he's emotionally invested in, I, I, I just have to ask like, do you think I disagree with that? I mean, do you think anyone disagrees with that? Like it is an extremely cold take. It is a throw hot water in the air and watch it freeze before it hits the ground temperature of take to say, hey, you're likely to perform better at an event with a main character you have an emotional connection with. Like, that is the basis of basic information. I completely agree with this, and I don't understand how that data point being an indisputable fact in any way impacts where you would place a main character on a tier list. So I just think if, if we all agree, hey, in order to get a good result with Sister Grimm, you have to work a little harder. Like, yeah, like tier one main characters, the results are probably gonna come a little easier because they're more powerful. 
that doesn't mean tier two. Like, it feels like the interpretation that Vern is operating from, and again, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, so if this is incorrect, please correct me. But it feels like the interpretation Vern, of tier list that Vern is operating from is tier two means this main character can't win. And I just don't think that that is a common interpretation of what tier two men means. Even tier four doesn't mean the main character can't win. Like even Kid Kaiju wins some of the time. Like the the direct linkage of the abstract power level of a card and where it falls on the tier list or and, and its win rate just doesn't make any sense. Like the most powerful cards in the game, like a really, really, really high win rate for a main character would be 60%. That still means that main character loses 40% of the time. Like, if, tier one doesn't mean you never lose any more than tier three means you never win. Like, and, and if that's the interpret, and honestly, if that is the interpretation of tier list that Vern is applying, well, then I, I am forced to agree with more or less everything he says. I just think that starting place, that foundation of thinking of a tier list that way is not helpful. I, I don't think that makes sense at all. Uh, so I, I just don't think going, hey, I got some wins with a main character people think is bad means that that may, maybe it means that main character is better than people thought. Sure. Uh, like if somebody didn't test Iceman and just looked at it and went, this is trash. Uh, and then you got a win with it. Okay, well, you put the work in to get that win. I don't think me saying a main character is trash is the same as saying that main character will never under any circumstance win a game. I mean, okay, to be fair, if we're being like super hyperbolic and like having big reactions to spoilers or something, I, it, there's probably takes that hot out there. But in, in when cooler temperatures prevail, when we're breaking this stuff down analytically, I, I don't think anybody in their bones genuinely believes those kind of extreme things. These are card games. Again, an extreme win rate means you're losing almost half your games. That's just true. So to talk about testing, um, I want to preface this by saying or by telling a story that I've told on the show before about a time when I screwed up in testing. When I was testing for the Benchwarmers format during the lockdown midwinter, I played Red Skull a handful of times, like less than five. I, I, I think three, but it's been a long time. And each time I played him, I whiffed the Wakandas. I didn't hit the equipment. Like it just, and that was my bias when I approached that testing. And I didn't push past that bias to continue spending my time trying to work on Red Skull because we only have so many hours in the day. We, we can only play so many test games. And obviously, given the winner of that event, it turned out that I made the wrong call there. I should have kept testing that main character. So to say that a person encounters a main character they're not ready for in a tournament and by being taken by surprise, saying that that's the fault of the, the player being taken by surprise, that is also a sub-zero take. Duh. <laughs> like, of course. Of course. But nobody is ever going to have perfect testing. And knowing that, like, you can't pretend that you don't know that that's part of the calculation here. That's, like, if we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about bad faith, and I, I do, actually, I take that back. I don't want to apply that. But if we're going to talk about sort of not thinking carefully through these arguments, I think we have to acknowledge that every single person who chooses a tier three MC, whether it's primarily motivated because they have an emotional connection to that main character or motivated by whatever, like whatever the primary motivation is, part of that calculation absolutely has to be, hey, people aren't going to have spent as much time testing this. Like one of the big knocks against playing a tier one deck is knowing that the entire field is going to have some version of your deck in their testing gauntlet and they're going to be more prepared for you than they're going to be more prepared for a tier two or a tier three main character because we all have finite time we all have finite testing available to us and i don't think like and yeah that's it, each person's testing is their own responsibility like yeah talk talk about the most agreeable uh, hot take I've ever heard. Yeah, yeah, 
I take responsibility for my own testing. I preface this with a story where I got something wrong in my testing gauntlet and then I paid for it in the top cut of that event. So that's all, that's all true and I don't think anybody thinks otherwise. Uh, but I also have to like implore Vern to like, let's just be honest about the facts here. And the fact is, if you're choosing to play a main character that less people are going to have spent a lot of time with testing, while that less time that they chose to spend is definitely their fault, taking advantage of that situation is the choice of the, the player picking the main character. And that's part of what goes into the calculation. Like how many times have you heard somebody say something like, oh, this, this main character, I, you know, I, I, let's not even make it abstract. I played Sister Grimm at a number of events and I have been very open about how most people don't think Sister Grimm's good and I used that ignorance of how she performed and what I was trying to do to my advantage in more than one event. Like I think the cat's out of the bag now, uh, so I don't know that she would perform as well as she once did. But if I roll into an event with Runaway Chopper and I'm not seeing Kelly and I'm not seeing like, if you have to kill me to beat me and I have Runaway Chopper, you're probably going to lose unless you have some specific tech cards. How are you going to have those tech cards? By testing and being ready for that kind of deck. And if you fail to do that, yeah, that's on you. Again, I agree. I'm kind of looping on this point, but it's just, it's mystifying to me that anybody thinks, I, I don't think I've ever heard anybody say, my testing is the responsibility of my opponent. I'm sure that's not what Vern meant. And I'm... <laughs> Again, I'm coming back to, I'm trying to not put words in his mouth. I'm trying to be as good faith as possible, but I, I genuinely don't understand the, the basis of that. Like, what does that take arguing against? Like, who are the people that say it's their opponent's responsibility to, to handle their test? I don't get that. So to move on, I want to go and talk about some of the emotional stuff here. Like, first of all, I think anybody who says getting lucky that, that Team X to Apex's tournament finishes are the result of pure luck is a fool. That's utter nonsense. Uh, luck plays a role in every everyone who ever wins at, a, at an event, luck played a role. But to use that role to diminish another player's accomplishments, I think is gross. And so if anything I said came off in that way, I full stop take it back and apologize. That was never my intent. Now, I don't think... <laughs> My intent was never to sound that way, uh, but sometimes I get a little loose. So if, so if it did, again, total recant, I misspoke. That's not what I meant. Uh, and that goes, like, across the board, like, for any player. I think we can acknowledge that variance is a thing, and taking advantage of other players' lack of testing specific things is a thing, and neither one of those things should diminish the result. Like, like Vern said, Bam won those games. I agree. We can dismantle those games and talk about how much of a role luck played, how much of a role the matchups played. Like, I think that's all fair game for discussion. But the moment somebody uses that discussion to try to discredit or diminish the victory that a player achieved, I'm out. I'm out. I disagree. I think that's gross. I No, I don't agree with that. Um, kind of the same way that I approached the testing conversation, I feel like I, I'm... I'm running the risk of just being repetitive here, so I will again lay out my comments about middling main characters, but I'll, I'll try to do so succinctly. And the first thing I want to do is flag the word overlooked. So when we first started talking about this, Vern took umbrage. Oh, wait, I got to talk about that again, too. Uh, yes, I do take umbrage at accusing the versus community of groupthink, because again, I'm operating from the narrow definition of what groupthink is, which is, you know, socially enforced orthodox thinking. And I don't think that's fair or accurate to apply to the versus community. Now, if you're using the word groupthink in a different way, I meant to say this earlier, if you're using the word groupthink in a different way, and, and it just means, hey, I'm influenced by influential people, well, then I, I have to agree with that because that's objectively true. Like when new players come into the game, of course they're going to listen to people who know more than them. So depending upon what we mean by groupthink, if we're using like the actual definition of the term, I do take umbrage. 
I think that's an insult to the versus community, and I don't think it's factu factually accurate. If we're instead describing the way that a new player comes in and maybe takes everything as gospel that comes from popular like creators or, or popular players, and then they start to realize, hey, not everything this person does gels with my play style, um, then yes, I totally, then I will agree with that completely. And if that's what the original hot take was meant, then okay, we had miscommunication. We were just talking past each other. I will acknowledge that I am very capable of getting hung up on the axle of word definitions, uh, particularly when they're as incendiary and frankly, yeah, insulting to the community I love so much as, as a term like groupthink is. But if that's not the way it was intended, I, I leave the door open there uh, to, to have Burn correct me or, or clarify. Uh, okay, so back to the main character thing. Uh, I don't think good tournament results... I kind of already blew th through this with the playtesting, but I don't think good tournament results change the power level of a main character. It could be the case that people look at an MC and go, oh, that's not good, and they don't test it because of their preconceived notions that it's not good, and then somebody shows up at a tournament and has a good result, and the community has to go, oh, you know what? Actually, our preconceived notions were wrong. It, I'm... I, guess but does that mean like taking a main character from this is completely unplayable this is tournament suicide to oh you can actually have a positive record with it or maybe even make top eight with it does that take it from dumpster to tier one i, I don't think it can if a tier list is going to mean anything because for one uh, and i apologize if it makes bam uncomfortable to be constantly used as the example here but Vern said himself he doesn't understand how bam is able to take a character like buffy and get the results he gets through the emotional commitment that he has. So for a player like Vern, that's not going to work. Like, it sounds like even if Vern had an emotional commitment to Buffy or any other character, that would not be sufficient for him to crack the, to crack the case on how to build for that main character. There has to be something else there that he gravitates toward mechanically. And that's completely okay. We're, we're all allowed to be different kinds of players. And I think a tier list is meant to be kind of like in a vacuum. Hey, here's what the matchups look like. Now take this sort of like rough guide and you have to apply your own perspective and proclivities to it. Like if you're a player who really needs a main character, who's always ready to fight, then like Flash Thompson probably isn't the guy for you because he has such bad stats at level one. And even when he levels up, he levels back down. Like he, you can't use him to actually fight for the whole game. And if that's something that you really need from your main character, then you're probably not going to have great results with Flash Thompson. Does that mean he's not tier one? I, I don't think so. Like as a whole in the meta, I mean, maybe he's not tier one for you, but if we're getting to the point of having like personal tier lists in order to discuss them intelligently, well, that's just not reasonable. So I think we can both acknowledge that a tier list is a guide. It should not be set in stone. It should not be like a group think kind of thing where it's saying, Hey, I think this character is better than you think it is. Like for one, the disagreements are some of the most fun we have in this community. And again, the accusation of group think, if, we're going from the narrow definition that is actually what the term means. Uh, we don't see the kind of community enforcement telling people to shut up or, or be quiet when they want to try to do really well with a main character that's of personal significance to them. Like I think of Sean wearing his Venom t-shirt with his Venom mat, with his Venom sleeves, winning, uh, placing a top eight with his Venom deck. And like, that's a story that I think was received very positively within the community and, and people thought it was cool. So I guess if I'm trying to be as charitable as I possibly can to Vern's argument, I would phrase it as people in the community sometimes allow influential people to influence them too much and that can be a negative. And if, and if that's Vern's argument, if I would actually probably be okay with agreeing with that. I, I can't necessarily put my hands on distinct examples where I go, oh, this person convinced me to play a main character and it ruined my fun. I, it, but it's, it's probably happened. It's probably happened. 
Um, you know, it, I certainly happened within my play group where I've been like, hey guys, I'm choosing between these two cards and I weigh in with my friends and my friends influence my choice. And then ultimately it's like, ah, you guys steered me wrong. Uh, it, but again, I don't, I don't think that's groupthink. I think that's just learning. I think that's just the sort of symbiosis of being part of a community and, and exchanging uh, knowledge back and forth. So to finish this up, I just want to say it is always my intent to meet people's arguments where they are, hear them as they intend them, and engage with what's actually being said and not talk past each other. So to the extent that I've been guilty of that and made Vern feel like his arguments aren't being understood, I apologize. I hope this time around I did a better job of capturing what he wanted to say and articulating the uh, handful of places where we actually have disagreements. So this has been a very rambly Build Phase podcast. I'm Mr. Ben. Go win some games.